You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Better Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Koku. Um, today's show, well, before we get into today's show, let me give the customary free biz shout out. Uh, free business shout out goes to Stephanie Renee's Salon, located at 1614 West Main Street in Kalamazoo, Michigan. The zip code there is 49006. You can reach Stephanie Renee's Salon at 269 459 6535. That's 269 269- Four five nine six five three five. Uh, they're conveniently located inside Cali Beauty. Next up is Amy Marie. dot Maven. dot com. That's A M Y M A R I E. dot M A Y V E N N. dot com. Um, they also deal in natural hair care products. Uh, their mission is to provide high-quality products with unparalleled uh, shopping experience, um, world-class technology and hair care products, etc. You can find them at amymarie.maven.com. Next up is uh, Melanated Conscious Society. You heard me uh, talking to Kepra L. on my podcast several weeks back. Uh, you can find them at www.melanatedconsciousociety.com. Uh, MelanatedConsciousSociety.com is a mentor, black community empowerment organization in Jacksonville, Florida. Make sure to follow them on um, all social media platforms. And if you have a skill or talent related to uh, marketing, like social media marketing or graphics or whatever you can do, or, or you know, uh, reach out to them. And offer your assistance. You know, it's for a good cause. It's it's organizing for our people. Uh, lastly, uh, Glenae Davis on uh, Twitter. Uh, she could be reached at G-L-E-N-N-A-E-R-N at gmail.com. Uh, I'll just read what she sent me. She said, hello, thanks for your reply. I'm Glenae Davis, an L.A.-based registered nurse, author of a critically acclaimed memoir, Yet Here I Stand creator and chief nurse of Nave's Vision, a healthcare media empire where we provide the healthcare education and planning to bridge the gaps of knowledge between discriminated, disadvantaged people facing employment discrimination and the healthcare industry, resulting in having a strategic plan with the medical support they need to no longer be victimized, merchandised, or marginalized by the system. I currently have two products available for your listeners. Number one is the memoir, and number two, a free health checklist. So, guys, uh, if you're listening, make sure to reach out to Glenay Davis. Once again, her email address is G-L-E-N-N-A-E-R-N at gmail.com. I also want you guys to take a listen to this. Greetings, family. In case you didn't know, the Bitter Medicine Podcast hosts an online book club. Every month, we will select a book to inspire the Bitter Medicine Podcast listening audience to read along together. At the end of the month, we will host a call-in show book discussion live on YouTube. This is a great dynamic way for readers to not only enjoy a book, but also have others to bounce ideas off of. It's been said that if you want to hide anything from black people, put it in a book. Do not allow this to be true anymore. Head over to www.bittermedicineblogs.com and subscribe to our newsletter for important updates. Do that today. 
Join our reading collective today and empower yourselves, your family, and your community. Peace. Yes, indeed. And this month we are reading Destruction of Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams. Make sure to head over to bittermedicineblogs.com or bittermedicinepodcast.com, navigate to the book club page, and use the affiliate link to order your copy today. It's still time to get involved, to join in with us. This is a great book to read. This should be a priority reading for every one in the black community. Uh, so join us today. Now to our show today. I am pleased to have this guest on. This guest was referred to me by Kepra L. from Melanated Conscious Society. This guest is a literary artist, performer, and educator from Jacksonville, Florida. Her name, Ebony Payne English. I'd like to welcome to the show Ebony Payne English. Ebony, are you on the line? I am peace and light. Peace. Peace and peace and blessings to you too. So, Ebony, your bio says that you uh, are the first woman to establish your own chapter of the international poetry organization, Black on Black Rhyme, that happened in 2017. You're the cultural uh, cultural council of Greater Jacksonville emerging artists and recipient of the spoken word uh, Gala's 2017 William Bell Humanitarian Award. It also says that you're the managing director of the Performers Academy, a 501c3 arts education organization that offers programs to benefit foster teens and other underserved populations by creating special tailored programs for those who may never experience um, the passion of the performing arts. It says you are also, it says that um, you, are also, you also serve on the board of directors of Southern Fried Poetry Incorporated, the largest adult regional poetry slam in the nation, and your director of programming for Jack's Youth Poetry Slam. So, uh, Ebony, you are a very busy person and a very dedicated person to the art form of poetry. Can you introduce yourself in your own words to the to the listeners? Uh, yeah. Um, as you said, I'm Ebony Tame English. I am a mother, a uh, artist, a uh, educator. Um, an activist from Jacksonville, Florida, and um, I'm, I'm 34 years old, and I just I have a passion for the youth. I have a passion for my people, and I have a passion uh, for my community. And yeah, that's who I'm. Excellent, excellent. And I'm guessing that you you've uh, worked with or a member of Melanated Conscious Society. Um, I. Did I hosted? Um, we had a something in Jacksonville called the Royal Gala, the Royal Ball this year. That was the first one, and uh, I was the host of it. And so I got a chance to meet um, the brothers and sisters from that community there. They attended uh, that event. Oh, okay, okay. So as I understand it, do you have a a new book coming out? Um, I have a book uh, out. It's it's already been released. It's called Secrets of My Art. Mm -hmm. And it's a 42-poem collection um, of my interpretations of the, the principles of my art, the affirmations that um, uh, they used to govern the people by and commit. So uh, I wanted to discuss that. A lot of uh, people are not familiar. And because from that body of work, uh, most religious texts and laws that we, we still follow today were drawn from that body of work. I wanted to make sure that uh, I gave voice to it and uh, shed some light on what those principles are and my interpretation of how they they are enforced or how we experience them in day to day life. That's interesting because you're absolutely correct. We have a lot of people who follow Ten Commandments, for example, 
not know, not realizing that it came from 42 laws, right? So, right. So what do you think? Do you think because people follow 10 that there is a fall off in how people conduct themselves? Like, you know, do you think we're That's- missing something? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, when you condense something so robust, uh, you, you open yourself up, you leave room um, for there to be things uh, left off. For instance, like if, um, if, if somebody was holding um, the police officer to the affirmation that I, I affirm that all life is sacred, Right. If somebody was actually holding them to that, it wouldn't matter uh, what they said that they were doing. If Sandra Bland um, cursed out the entire police department and the judge themselves, uh, if we were holding them accountable to that affirmation, none of this would be acceptable. Nothing going on would be acceptable. Um, and so the, that's the issue that we have uh, for you to take 42 laws and convince them to 10 and then leave those open to interpretation to a system that has uh, historically uh, been set up to oppress and suppress um, our freedom and our freedom of speech and thought and practice of our um, traditional beliefs, then you, you, you know, you're in trouble. How could I ever look to that and, and expect there to be justice? My art means truth and justice. So how could I be expecting my art to come from something that's already stolen Ten of the laws and use them against us, use them to harm people, um, and then look to them and try to hold them by those ten laws in which to avenge us. That's not going to work. I I agree a hundred percent. I mean, one of the things um, a lot of people read it in these religious books, but they don't they don't really fully understand it. I guess is you can't throw pearls to swine, right? You can't take right. something good and expect something good to come of it from a people who aren't historically good. So, um, you know, what we see with the laws of the land is uh, it should be understood that the the folks who took the original 42 and, and you know, boiled it down to 10, uh, uh, you know, sometimes 9, um, <laughs> they... Um, they they do, they didn't have good intentions even amongst themselves, much less right. good intentions for us, right? So right. this is why we see, you know, what's going on out here. And in terms of retribution, uh, you know, you put it as people, you know, keeping, uh, keeping, I guess, the police or whatever in check. But we need to work on systems of, enacting retribution when things happen to us as well. Um, to you, yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. What, are the, what are the most important laws of Ma'at that no one talks about to you? Um, I speak with good intent. Mm. <laughs> uh, a, a lot of times uh, people underestimate the power of the conversation or the conscious word. Yes. And uh, so many people speak uh, when they should be listening. And uh, so many people speak uh, with intent to divide or intent to destroy or intent to exert their authority and not necessarily to give good um, to the environment that they're speaking in. And so uh, if I cannot speak with good intent, I attempt to remain silent. Because uh, I don't want to ever p- pollute my manifestations. I only want to manifest uh, constructive things to this plane of existence because there's been so much uh, to the contrary. Um, I benefit with gratitude. It's a really important piece mm-hmm. to me. Uh, gratefulness. There's so much ugly. There's so many things that break my heart um, that sometimes I forget to be grateful Uh, for the opportunity to invoke change and influence and just to be alive and uh, to share this human experience and encounter the souls that I have that are, are, that are trying to do something and that are, you know, 
able to like at least make me feel released to some sort um, in this place that we live. So like I have find myself consistently reminding myself to be thankful and be grateful because there are a lot of beautiful things as well. As much that has happened to us and continues to happen to us, there are many beautiful things about the Black experience in America that I share, that I take part in. Um, so I think that's a very important one. And um, I remain in balance with my emotions. Uh, that is a very key component. When uh, you make emotional decisions, mm -hmm. uh, you open yourself up to make mistakes. Right. You have to have a clear head. This fight requires a clear head. We have to be thinking clearly. We have not been thinking clearly. We've been feeling. <laughs> We've been feeling it. Um, you know, no shade, but I think that that's one of the biggest issues that I've I've encountered with the black church is that it wants you to feel all the time. Mm -hmm. Everybody's always in their emotions all the time. And so they're governing themselves off of emotional and rash decisions. Um, when I think that if they just took a minute, to think like and use apply logic to a lot of this stuff uh, that goes on, a lot of the things that they're preaching, preaching and feeding our children, um, things will be different. Well, so, yeah. Well, you know, that's an excellent point you made. Um, the black community operates on a set of illogical principles, right? And a lot of it comes from the church. Um, did you grow, did you grow up in the black church? I did. I grew up in the black church. Um, my mother is a third generation preacher. Uh, my father is a preacher as well. He's a Pentecostal bishop. Okay. Um, but I, I am not a Christian. I don't identify as a Christian. I don't share the same beliefs as uh, most Christians. If you don't mind me asking, what led you to separate from that ideology? I mean, because I, I, too, grew up around the church, but I, I separated from that mentally at a pretty young age. What, what, if I don't, if you don't mind me asking, what led you to separate? I discovered love of myself. Mm. <laughs> I learned to love myself. I was 19 years old the first time I learned to love myself. Mm. And when I learned to love myself, I could never believe that I was unworthy of my creator's love that I was born into sin when all I did was be born and my parents were married at the time I was born, you know, um, like I, there were just certain fundamental things. I just could never believe. I could never believe that our creator would instruct, um, a man to kill his own son. I couldn't believe that my creator would give birth to a child only to have that child murdered before the eyes of his mother mm -hmm. in public. Um, they're just, I couldn't believe that my creator could be so emotional uh, that they, they would choose a certain group of people to be exhausted over another group of people because that's almost co-signing slavery or endorsing um, oppression. And why would a, a creator of all things show favoritism to one thing? Um, it, it, it's just plenty of problematic things that I found in the Bible once I learned to love and value myself. Um, and I, I just, I had to break away. I had to find my own path and um, find out who I was before I became who they told me to be. Right. Once I did that, uh, I just made it, I made a conscious effort and commitment to um, share that with, with the youth and share that with my community. Yeah, I think for me personally, I think um, when I learned that, that God in the Bible is supposed to be a jealous God. That there's something about that that just Yeah, that's what I mean. Me. God is emotional. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> like they, there's something about that that fundamentally doesn't sit well with me. Uh I wish there were more folks like you. I'm not trying to turn people away from you know, a belief, but I want people to inject some reality, some realism into their belief and into their situation. Because what we're seeing is a lot of our people, uh, their belief has them inactive. Their belief has them basically like a doormat. You know, you, you take anything that occurs in this world to you because you're, you're looking forward to something greater in the next world. And I, I, there's something about that that's just wrong to me. Uh, I 100% agree. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it offends my sensibilities 
that's that's another thing I learned. Uh, once I discovered love of self, I discovered a, a hunger for knowledge of self, mm. right? And once I, I I wanted to learn who I am, why I am, where I come from, where my people come from, who they are, who they were, um, who they who they are becoming, um, I just I things started to offend my sensibilities. Like when I when I read it or when I hear it, it just it uh, it, it gives me tingles. Like it it makes me cringe. And that was some some of the things. Those were some of the things that God is a jealous God. Uh, you know, I was born into sin. Like so, those things I just I couldn't accept. I could no longer accept. So, based on your study, based on your you know your journey, what is God to you? Um, to me, God is love, and love is the energy of creation, and so. Um, that's why I take my artistry so seriously because it's my opportunity to express the God within me mm-hmm. as a creator. And so, um, yeah, that's the best I can describe it. The love that I have for my daughter is the most God I've ever felt. Right. So, like, for lack of a better word, I call it love, but that energy it's, that you feel is God. When you, it's God. Yeah. Okay. Now you your work is directed towards the black community. Um, a lot of people who came up religious, their thoughts are not towards the black community. In fact, when something happens, they tend to co-sign whatever it is white society says about black society. Um, for example. You know, if a police officer kills a, a a black youth in the street, the first thing some white folk and some other, you know, uh, weak-minded black folks will start talking about is Chicago, black on black crime, etc. How has your um, rebirth in Maat? How has that changed your view of the black community and what the black community needs? Well, it caused me to stop looking at symptoms and start looking at the source. Right. So when we talk about the violence in Chicago, um, we have to talk about the fact that the assault rifles that these young people have in their hands, they made in the USA on the side of mm-hmm. So we have to talk about how our military-grade weapons finding themselves on the streets of Chicago in the hands of 14 and 15-year-olds. Mm-hmm. How, how is that happening? And when we start talking about that and start asking those questions, you know, then it always comes back. The, the finger always, all four of the other fingers always point back yeah. to the government, the systematic institution in which this country has sought to take our lives, even if it is uh, coercing us to take each other's lives in our own. Um, there is no reason whatsoever to have a military, a militarized police force in an American city. Right. There is no reason. Right. And then there, Chicago has the most policing in the country, yet it has the most violent crime, mm-hmm. which is to say um, the police are not doing their job. And if I do my job poorly, if somebody's spending a billion dollars a month on me yeah. and I do my job poorly, I get fired. I don't get to keep my job. I don't get a promotion. I don't get a new police academy because maybe their training is off. I get fired. Yeah, yeah. Um, th- that's what I've learned because my is all about exercising the logic, exercising your instinct, exercising the higher self, and, and learning to observe your environment with the, with your third eye open and understanding that what we've been told, everything we're, we're being told is a is a lie. It's a lie. And if you pay attention to the evidence, because it's not without evidence, um, everything points back to to where we are, the government of this country, the governing rulers of this country, and the evil that they have done and continue to do against the American people. Uh, let's take a quick station ID break. We'll be right back on the other side. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAC Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Black people face one problem, the problem of ignorance. This is why those who opposed us stole us from our parents, 
disconnected us from our continent and enforced on us illiteracy. But now the ignorance is self-inflicted. We send our children to their machines. We detach ourselves from our motherland and we don't read meaningful literature. Consciousness is a series of stages. The sooner we get to one, the sooner we are ready for the higher. The pro-black compendium accelerates the beginner to the advanced and provides for the advanced an unparalleled breath. This is the sort of book your enemies do not want you to read, but our ancestors would insist you read twice. Peace Seeker, this is only from the pro-black perspective and we need power. Power will not be handed to us. We need to build power. But in order to build power, we need a power blueprint. You need to study the best blueprints available. You have Gardens. You have Wilsons. You have Williams. You have mine. Now, you'll have Cooks. Carlos A. Cooks was Garvey's best student. The greatest mind in the world from 1940 to 1966. Yes, the greatest. Yet Whitey doesn't want you to read his blueprint. Cook's blueprint isn't religious. Cook's isn't for integration. Cook's isn't for communism. Cook's isn't even for anti-blacks. Cook's blueprint is for Africa. And Cook's blueprint is the unknown blueprint that was the basis of black power as we know it today. When you say buy black, you're talking about Cook's. When you say black is beautiful, you're talking about Cook's. When you say Malcolm got something right, you're talking about Cook's. But Cook's blueprint was lost, and Whitey is hiding that blueprint behind a thousand dollar paywall. He's hiding solutions from you, telling you you need to take out a small loan to get the information that can liberate you. Whitey does not want you to have solutions to your problems, but you need solutions. You need power. I will give you the Carlos A. Cooks Reader, valued over $1,000 at a 98% discount, $15. Send $15 to cash.me slash dollar sign ABS Oni with the subject Carlos and your email address and I'll send you the ebook. We need power. You need blueprints. Start building today. Greetings, family. This is Koku, host of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. In case you didn't know, we have an online book club called the Bitter Medicine Book Club. Every month, we will select a book to inspire the Bitter Medicine Podcast listening audience to read along together. At the end of the month, we will have a call-in show and book discussion. This is a great, dynamic way for readers to not only enjoy a book, but also have others to bounce ideas off of. They say if you want to keep anything away from black people, put it in a book. Don't allow this to be true. Head over to bittermedicineblogs.com and subscribe to our newsletter for important updates. Do that today. Join our reading collective today and empower yourselves, your family, and your community. Peace and blessings. You 
you are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. I I want to play this poem I found of yours on YouTube. Just just listen to this, guys. I am Leo. I am mother. I am hunter. I am golden. I am queen. I am the music. Miraculous moments manifest monogamous magic. We worthy wordsmiths waver wands, pinning purposeful pain, palming power, balling, beautiful billows, bashful bellows. Hey yo, uh uh. Oh, I a crowded basketball court on a Saturday afternoon. The lyricists huddled in the far right corner. I drink the venomous spit flaming from their lips. It tastes a rainbow away from struggle. Cautiously colorful, brilliantly curved. The metaphors, the punchlines, the bars, they are standing behind, but do not grab hold to. They are the thunder kept in time by the shrieking teeth and beatbox wind of head nodding kin. James Brown legacy, loud and lingual. They are the breaks, the t- t- hit me. They are the say it with your chest. They are the yes and the no and the Got him? Fly as jets, larger than life, dope as heroin, heroin a Joan of Arc, Arc Angels, fresh antiques, inexperienced wisdom, street corner freeways, gracious rude boys, palpable deities, they're hip hop. You found me. Two decades ago, shaking in hysterical knuckles, killed over butcher knife, fighting my demons for my life, you chided my cowardice. I confided my powerlessness. You presented me to Apocalypse, to Shay. And that day, I wept for Brenda's baby on my cousin's bedroom floor behind closed doors. You coerced me into being a happier ending to the story. Rehabilitated my hood rat dreams to glory from deferment. Released my rooftop rhythms from internment. And the sky is a limit and you know that you keep on, just keep on pressing on. The sky is the limit and you know that you can have what you want, be what you want, have what you want, be what you want. I am Leo. I am queen. I am golden. I am mother. I am hunter. I am the music. That's uh, Ebony Payne right there. That's a spoken word piece called Dare Hip Hop. Ebony uh, we've, been, we've been talking about, uh, by the way, I, I, I love that piece. We've been talking about Ma'at and um, Ma'at and its, and its usage or how it should be used in the black community. Um, a lot of people consider uh, American black culture the equated with hip hop. Um, do you see that equivalency? Uh, yes, I do. Um... And, I mean, they call it hip-hop now, before it was um, the culture of the griot, <laughs> and before then it was storytelling, mm. um, and before then it was drum circles, yeah. um, and, and, and before then, you know, it was, it was our folklore. Like, uh, it has evolved into what they now refer to as hip-hop. hip-hop. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of the things I, I always uh, loved about Brother Malcolm. He would always say the so-called Negro, right. you know, <laughs> like uh, the the so-called hip hop culture. Right. Um, that that's what it's about. But we, our people, we're storytellers. We're historians. We are the scribes. Uh, we are we are the 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 informants. Uh, t- Timbuktu. That that's where they house the books, the scrolls, the texts. It, the world, the world's history, the world's culture is passed through our people. Mm. And we have to, we have to start accepting that. Hip hop is just another form of reporting or storytelling. And when they could get their hands on our stories, they did. Uh, just like the Bible, 
Uh, they got their hands on on the skulls of my eye, and they polluted it. And when as soon as they got their hands on hip hop, they polluted it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, by at its core, um, it's just a storyteller, it's a rhythm. The drums are there. Just us doing what we do naturally, what comes natural to us. Mm-hmm. Um, so hip hop has been a major influence of my work. It's been a, a major venue in which I used to communicate with my students. And, um, you know, I, I'm all for, for promoting that culture and for acknowledging the impact that it has had on the world, on the global culture as a whole. So, yeah. Before we um, discuss your book a little bit more in depth, um, tell me more about your work in terms, like, how, how did you decide to meld the work that you do with my art and with poetry? Um, well, my work is dedicated to the human experience. That's, that's my life. Um, it's more like journalism. It's creative journalism. Okay. And I find true stories to tell based on the human experience. And based on my experience in my own community. So that's that's what's been like the major inspiration behind the work that I do. Um, in order for me to accurately um, discuss the human experience, I I sought to go back to the beginning. And so um why do humans behave the way that they do? A lot of that has to do with culture and law and societal norms <laughs> and social interactions. And uh, so where does that come from? So it led me back to um, the empires of the past. And the more I kept digging, eventually I found my way back to Africa. Eventually I found my way back to Africans. And eventually I found my way back to where there was peace amongst us, mm. between us, and a sense of order um, and complexity and appreciation for each other and our way of life. And when I found that, I found my eye. And when I began to explore my eye, I began to see just how they were able to manipulate um, what was familiar to us and uh, make what was once very familiar, what was once our um, creation, unfamiliar and, and perverted. And so I sought to tell stories that showed influence of who we once were, um, just to remind ourselves, just to remind ourselves, and, and maybe a gentle reminder is all some people need uh, to spark that, to spark, because I believe in genetic memory. Right. So it's not that Me too. Uh, we've forgotten forever. We haven't forgotten forever. Mm-hmm. And one day, all of <laughs> the collective consciousness is going to be triggered. And, and we are going to return to our original selves, and and I want to I want to help with that, and so that's why my work uh, discusses a lot of that. I have I have work centered around the Yoruba culture as well, so um, I'm, I'm I'm exploring um, Zulu history, and I, I just I want to discuss all of it. I want to discuss all of it because we were great on a number of levels. There's levels to our greatness. Yeah. And there's more to our history than the Middle Passage. And I, I was just, I grew very tired of art, Black art, American art being centered around the Black experience as far as slavery is concerned and the after effects of that. Um, so let's talk about your, your book. What, what inspired you to write your, your current book? Um, Secrets of my eye, I I was inspired to inform people in my circle of influence of what my eye is and how it was stolen from us and what those principles could do for us if we embrace them as a culture right now. Okay. Okay. If we were to embrace them, do you think it would be difficult to get our people across the board to embrace the laws of my eye? No, we've already embraced them in a different form. We've embraced the Bible. We've embraced the Quran. We've embraced, uh, some of us have even embraced Buddhism. Uh, This is the premise. This is the premise. If we could only 
desire to go back to the beginning. And if we could only desire uh, to see in ourselves what we see in these Europeans, if we could only look at our people the way that we look at these Europeans, man, we, could, we could do anything. I, I agree with you. I'll just like to throw in there, though, that the problem with our people oftentimes is we don't do anything until a European tells us to do it. So this it, is true. no European is going to come along and say, you guys should follow the laws of my heart, which we stole and boiled down to ten to nine or ten laws. So what do you think is the biggest challenge there? Like how would we get someone interested in something that has the title Africa or Kemet on it? Uh, I, I, um, I do not know. Like, that's, that's the biggest problem, right, is that uh, the convincing. Yeah. But I, I'm not here to convince. I'm just here to share the information. And, and whoever will receive the information, then that's who the information is for. That's a good, um, great answer. I don't really have the time. We don't have the time right now. Things have got, gotten to the point where... Time is not at our disposal. No, it's not. So we don't have the time right now to focus on those who are, are going to be disagreeable and who are, you know, <laughs> are, are stuck to the point where they have no desire to come out of the brainwashing. Like, I, I'm just here to present information to those who are capable of being saved. And the only ones who are capable of coming out of this oppression that we've been locked into for hundreds of years are those who, who are going to listen and recognize truth and admit the truth when they see it. That's absolutely And that goes for Europeans, too. Europeans are not exempt from admitting truth. They're right. human beings. Right. They're not exempt from admitting truth, and some of them are able to admit the truth. And so, you know, th those are the people I'm here for, are the people who can encounter the truth and accept it and acknowledge it when they see it. That's it. So I'm presenting the information for those people. Okay. I, I I agree with that as well. I think the days of trying to convert and bring people over, I think we got to kind of leave. I, I think we need to at least bless them with the information. And if they choose not to follow it, you leave them where they are. You know, Marcus Garvey talked about yeah. if you're yeah. not if you're not putting in if you're not interested in the collective in America. When we go back to Africa, you could stay in America. Yes. You know? <laughs> yes. So. Yes. It would not be for everybody. Yes. Um, everybody that's uh, skin folk ain't kin folk either. Exactly. So, would you bless us with a spoken version of your poem, of a poem from the book? Absolutely. Um, and the poem that I chose is Affirmation 21. Okay. And it's, uh, I spread joy. Because um, we are deserving of joy. And there are so many joyless things about the human existence for the black person living in America. But um, this is my hope, is that uh, I do spread joy and that uh, my people learn to spread joy to each other. Okay. There was a 5.31 p.m. sunset. We observed it from a black sand beach. The clouds were so close we could reach them. The ninth one speaking definitively. The sun made Monet of the sky. The ocean surface inherited the streaming shades. We lay bare back and relaxed in an indigenous enclave. We made the most out of love. Correction. Love made the most out of us. Out of light. Out of impeding darkness out of explicit details, out of scales and balance, out of a challenge, out of a gift, out of our gifts, our lips, our hands, our demands and supplies of the time we knew not. There was, not no, there was no watch. There was no need. The breeze whispered to the sea of a people freed by the blade of their sharpened machetes, a people too heavy to be pushovers, whose elders were bulldozers, cleared their land of tyrants who sought to enslave us all. Homage was paid, libations were gave, we raised our vibrations, fine-tuned our frequencies, did not think on these things excessively. Instead, 
We welcomed a healthy degree of mindlessness. It invoked us into rest and meditation. We knew no hurry. We were without hesitation on this vacation. We decided to build a nation. We did not just get by. We got high too. Lived out loud. Bold. Proud. Our culture showing. Our children knowing themselves and being honored by their identity. They grew endlessly in wisdom and sapient stature. They were the heart of the matter. We wanted to feel alive. Our mission was not to survive, but to evolve and thrive. Our mothers no longer to cry. Our fathers home from their bids. All that we did was reflective of all that we've done. Someone acknowledged our humanity, our entitlement to respond to attack with reciprocity. We were not sweet, not docile, nor meek, humble, or kind. We changed our minds in Langston's absence. It was not tragic. It was not sad. It was glorious. It was at last. We were as vast and as black as that sand. We were as brilliant and as beautiful as that sky. Unapologetic, colorful, finally setting things right. I say. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I like it. Um, let's give a round of applause for that. You, um, you have another poem you're going to do for us? Yes. Okay, go Um, ahead. Take it away. This is Affirmation 42. And the affirmation is, I embrace the all. This is not pressure. This is promise. There is just as much stardust in you as a comet. It is locked inside your cells, held within each atom, Could you fathom your own integration into the order of operations of universal algorithms? You are a reverberating effect. Do not neglect to flex. You are spawned from the energy of nine synchronized orbits. You are the metamorphosis of the cosmos. For we know nine is the only number that gives birth to itself. Born of creative abilities, sensitivity, loyalty, discretion, benevolence, influence, understanding, Perfection, altruism, freedom, mysticism, perspective. We are corrective evolution. Stagnancy and gravity work in collusion to weigh down our movement, but self-improvement is one of the strongest adaptations. It is our obligation to grow. For we know nine is the number of divine purpose and wisdom. Within the system of our solar plexus, we've collected personal power, seconds, nor hours, nor years invoke fear inside the visionary. Being grounded to earth is light work. I have heard it is the fastest way to travel. I say. Excellent. Excellent. Love it. Absolutely love it. Um, Ebony, can you tell us about that first poem? Like, what, what does it what did it mean to you when you when you wrote it? Um, I spread joy. Um, when I wrote it, I, I I wanted to talk about my idea of what it is uh, to really achieve joy in this place. I'm from the South. I was raised in the South, born and raised in the South. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, the type of of evil that I have encountered from my Caucasian counterparts has been um, just unimaginable. And uh, oftentimes when I fantasize of a vacation, like I want it to be a joyful place, but like anytime people talk about going on vacation, like the only places they want to go is like places where there's a bunch of other colonizers, like, I, I don't want to go there. Right. Um, so when I thought of a vacation, I was like, I want to go someplace where I can spend days. And it gets me emotional just to talk about it. Like, that I don't have to see a European if I don't want to for days, right. for weeks even. I want the hotel I stay in to be owned by a person of color. I want the bank that I go to withdraw my money from to be owned by a person of color. I want the teller that I do my business with to be a person of color. I want the driver that picks me up to, from the airport to be a person of color. I want all the people in the store I'm shopping at to be people of color, from the manager to the other customers to, to, 
the cashiers. Like, I want to spend weeks and just look at people that look like me that engage in the human experience from a melanated perspective and um, that are smiling and laughing and not oppressed, have not been robbed of their nestled tongue Mm -hmm. that are speaking in their ancestors' language, Mm -hmm. that are able to teach their children traditions that have been passed down for generations and generations and generations. I want that. Mm -hmm. They have that. They have that experience on a daily basis. I have never known that. My daughter will never know that. And that is a different kind of joy. That is a different kind of security. That is a different kind of comfort level of being in a house that was built by your great, 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 great grandfather that still stands on land that your great, 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 great grandfather purchased that still grows crops, Mm -hmm. that still houses animals, that still feeds your family. That is a different kind of wealth. That is a different kind of life. And I, I, I want that. I want that for my people. And so when I wrote that poem, I allowed myself to take my, myself away from this place to a sense of a place of joy, of love, of acceptance, of company, of freedom. And I told the story. This is what I saw when I tranced out. This is what I saw. Mm-hmm. This is what I saw. And, uh, you know, I was honored to dwell there. If only for a moment, if only for a dream, <laughs> if only for a nightfall. I was just honored to be in that space and I wanted to share it with my readers. Um, what you what you said about that first poem is is a better speech to me than the I Have a Dream speech, frankly. Um, I think... You are, you are. I think to, to dream of that world, that world where everyone is genuinely African around you. Um, you know, and you don't have to... You see, cause the, the I Have a Dream speech was about integrating with Europeans, whereas you're talking about, like, kind of being nationalistic in a sense, where it's just you and yours in a space. And that, to me, yep. is, is a better dream. Um, Ebony, tell us about the second poem. Um, the second poem... Uh, was just, uh, when I was speaking up earlier, I I found myself. And when I I found myself, I couldn't let go. And what I found in myself was uh, the universe. Like, I, I, I started doing some research about melanin and, uh, the photosynthetic process. Mm -hmm. And, like, uh, when a, uh, when a seed is melanated, when a fetus is melanated, uh, the process that it goes through is very sim- similar to the photosynthetic process uh, that plants and trees and wildlife go through. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it made me uh, look at stars and how stars are born and what they're made of and like the element of stardust and what what that means and it, and it, and uh, the idea of evolution. And like what I came to is like, uh, we are dark matter. We are planetary matter. We are stardust. And if we can acknowledge for one moment that uh, the same thing that created this entire universe exists within ourselves, breaks down to the smallest molecule that exists within us, um, then we can acknowledge our own power yes. to create, to manifest something better. To to all it would take is for us to focus, mm-hmm. really. So that's what the idea. The idea cannot be killed. Idea is forever. Martin Luther King, yeah, he had a dream and he's dead, but the idea of that dream still exists, mm-hmm. even if that dream was misleading. Mm-hmm. The one of the reasons we we struggle so hard with uh, the black church is because of, a lot, largely in part because of that dream, that idea that he put in our head. Yeah. 
that our European uh, counterparts are civil yes. or capable of peace or capable of uh, keeping a treaty that they made when the Native Americans uh, showed us that mm-hmm. hundreds of years ago, they're incapable. It's not in their nature. They're survivalists. I don't fault them for that. They're survivalists. And in order for them to continue to survive and thrive, they cannot be peaceful with us. Right. We have too many children. Mm-hmm. Our women are too fertile. Our men are too strong. They're too athletic. They will certainly overtake them, overthrow them, continue to procreate with, it, with their women, and eventually deplete their race. So in order for them to survive, they must. They must oppress us. They must separate us. They must divide us. They must colonize us. And they must convince us to hate ourselves and each other. Hmm. And that's how they're able to survive. Absolutely. We survive on a very different way. We're different kind of people. We're different kind of tribes. You know, we're collective. We're tribe people. It's the collective. What happens to you happens to me. That's our thought process. That's the idea that genetically still exists inside of us to this day, which is why we cannot retaliate. While we are enabled, why it feels wrong, while we are sad when other when we see other people angry, and we say, you know, just love your brother, love you, because that is what just our genetic memory. Mm-hmm. So, like, if we can be reminded of these things, I know that we can be reminded of other things. Mm-hmm. And so that that was what that poem was about. I embrace the all. I mean, I embrace the all about my people, not just the fun and soft and squishy parts. I, I embrace the all. I accept that um, we we have existed at a sub level. I accept that. Um, I accept that I have been complicit for a certain part of my life in existing on this lower level. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also accept that we are made from stardust. I accept that we have the power to make things happen. I accept my power to ashe my life and to the life that I, I would like for me and my children to live. Uh, I said all those things. I accept my divinity. I accept my godhood. <laughs> I accept that my ancestors uh, have left clues for me to find the, follow the bread comes back to myself and to my people and to my tongue. All of that. So it's, it, it's not like you haven't done enough to... Um, make the listeners interested in purchasing your book, but um, let's have you speak to the listener and tell them why they should purchase your book. Um, well, Secrets of My Eye is a labor of love, and it is uh, dedicated to my community, to my people, to my loved ones, and um, everybody needs love in their life. And it's a book about love. It's 42 principles our ancestors left here for us because they loved us, because they love our children, because they want us to be our whole selves. They want us to be whole and complete. They know that we're divinely capable. Um, and they want us to be present at all times, mentally, spiritually, emotionally present. And we're, we're just not. We've checked out on them. And... Um, it's just, it's my love letter to, to my people and the ancestors. And I would really appreciate your support and um, your sharing of this collective wisdom and knowledge uh, that I have uh, put forth. And uh, you can find it on my website. It's www.ebonypainenglish.com. It's E-B-O-N-Y-P-A-Y-N-E-E-N-G-L-I-S-H. Ebonypainenglish.com. Um, under portfolio, all of my work's. My whole body of work is there um, for you to share and exchange. Uh, all of the music is free. Um, the book is $20. So I appreciate your support. Awesome. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah, I um, I urge all the listeners to to definitely support this sister. She's on to something here. She's, she's definitely on to something here. We need to go back to our traditional African way. We need to stop fighting our genetic memory of who we were, of who we are, and go back to that and then face the the force or the forces that are opposing us because that's how we're going to win. We got to become ourselves again to win. We can't be the pale imitation of ourselves and expect to beat this, this dominating force against us. 
Ebony, <clears throat> I want to thank you for appearing on the show. I, I, I know we started a, a little bit late, and I'm probably, probably holding yeah, you up right you now. Thank you for having me. But thank you, <laughs> for, awesome. thank you for appearing on the show. Um, let's keep in contact. I have some other stuff. It'll be nice to have your input on in the future. So let's, uh, Absolutely. Let, let, let's speak again soon. Um, and for the listeners, uh, make sure to um, purchase your copy of The Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams today. Make sure to join the join the book club because reading is fundamental. And uh, in fact, Ebony's book will be a book <clears throat> at some point on the book club roster um, because we should read a, a diverse set of uh, readings, you know, poems, uh, analysis, etc. So make sure to join today. Greetings, Bitter Medicine supporters. It's Caramel Yogi, a.k.a. Tamika, the creator of Victorious Ones LLC, where we help single parents find peace and harmony through meditation and vinyasa yoga. Visit Caramel Yogi on IG or send an email to caramelyogi at gmail.com. C-A-R-A-M-E-L-Y-O-G-I. We will help you stay on your path of peace and harmony. So we just had a discussion with Ebony Payne English, um, discussing her her recent book um, that she has available on her website. And the book um, uses the backdrop of the laws of Ma'at. Now, I know most of you are familiar with Moses and his Ten Commandments, but interestingly enough, a lot of you don't know that the Ten Commandments um, came from the 42 laws of Ma'at. Ma'at was the Egyptian goddess designed to basically stop chaos, chaos from happening um, and maintain truth. And, and truth the Egyptian word for truth is ma'at. So what you, what you do with the Ten Commandments is, um, the Ten Commandments is something that you say that you're not going to do, like thou shalt not, right? It's like a future thing. With ma'at, it's, a, it's more of, a, a, of an affirmation that I have not. So instead of saying thou shalt not kill, in Ma'at, you would have said, I have not killed. I have not done this. I have not done that. And so these 42 divine principles or laws of Ma'at are very interesting. They can be used today as a kind of a code. Now, I believe that codes of conduct, um, as with almost every other thing needs to be updated periodically, right? Times change, life changes. And so your codes or your laws or your rules need to change somewhat. Now, there's some laws that will remain fixed because there, there's nothing else you can change to, like the law of gravity is fixed, right? It is, is 9.8 meters per second squared. That's that's law that you're not going to really change that at this point, right? But um, with certain laws that we have in history, we should update them where possible. But the 42 divine principles of Ma'at are interesting, and I, I just want to take time after listening to uh, Ebony speak about the 42 laws and its inspiration on her and her work, I wanted to just make sure everyone knows what they are. Now, remember what I said. It's the case that you recited the 42 divine principles of Ma'at to affirm that you are not and have not done any of the following things, right? Uh, it's different from the commandments. The commandments is just something you kind of say 
you know, uh, really it's something said to you, right? Thou shalt not. But at no point with the commandments do you ever affirm that you haven't. And that's very powerful. Affirmations in general are powerful, but that affirmation in particular about the 42 divine principles of my art is very, very powerful. It means that you're still standing on your square. Okay, so the 42 divine principles of my art are I have not committed sin. I have not committed robbery with violence. I have not stolen. I have not slain men or women. Thou shalt not kill. I have not stolen food. I have not swindled offerings. I have not stolen from God or goddess, which shows you the Egyptians believed in the duality, the male and the female energy of God. I have not told lies. I have not carried away food. I have not cursed. I have not closed my ears to truth. I have not committed adultery. I have not made anyone cry. I have not felt sorrow without reason. I have not assaulted anyone. I am not deceitful. I have not stolen anyone's land. I have not been an eavesdropper. I have not falsely accused anyone. I have not been angry without reason. I have not seduced anyone's wife. I have not polluted myself. I have not terrorized anyone. I have not disobeyed the law. I have not been exclusively angry. I have not cursed God or goddess. I have not behaved with violence. I have not caused disruption of peace. I have not acted hastily or without thought. I have not overstepped my boundaries of concern. I have not exaggerated my words when speaking. I have not worked evil. I have not used evil thoughts, words, or deeds. I have not polluted the water. I have not spoken angrily or arrogantly. I have not cursed anyone in thought, word, or deed. I have not placed myself on a pedestal. I have not stolen what belongs to God or goddess. I have not stolen from or disrespected the deceased. I have not taken food from a child. I have not acted with insolence. I have not destroyed property belonging to God or goddess. Now, for the keen observer, you'll understand why some of those laws of my art weren't transferred to the commandments that you find in church. Europeans are steadily taken from children. They're steadily disrespecting the deceased, stealing from the dead. You see what I'm saying? The European is patriarchal in nature, so they won't acknowledge the goddess. Their trinity is three dudes. The Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. We always exalted the, the masculine as well as the feminine energy. We respected the dead. We respected people's property. Europeans don't. Europeans hardly respect themselves, if we're being honest. So the 42 Laws of my art, I want you guys to not only purchase Ebony's uh, book, but I want you guys to study your original laws and study the way it's worded. It's worded as something that you continuously update. I have not, since the last time I've recited these 42 laws, I have not done these things. Whereas your commandment, the Ten Commandments, or the sometimes Nine Commandments, are kind of like that sign you look at that says, don't enter this property, but you still cut through the property anyway. The Ten Commandments are like that sign. Yeah, they're up there, but you're going to walk past that and not think about it again. 
Yeah, you know about the laws, the Ten Commandments, but are you checking in with yourself and with your community every so often to ensure that you're upkeeping those laws? To put yourself through a trial to see if you're doing what your community needs you to do? Because let's be real. These laws, be it commandments, 42 divine principles of my art, a code of conduct, which you hear a lot of people talking about now, especially with the black community, they're all designed for the group to prosper. I've talked about this on the show before. They're all designed for the group to prosper. And if you notice something about these 42 laws, they don't use God to scare you into something. They mention God and goddess in terms of you revering God and goddess, but they don't use God and goddess to scare you into something. That's what the Ten Commandments do. You know, that whole story with Moses is to scare you. The reality of it is, those commandments, just like these laws of Ma'at, would come about from any thinking society that's small in numbers to start with and is trying to flourish. That's what a code of conduct does for you. In America, the black population is small comparatively so the laws of conduct or codes of conduct that we need would be for our society to flourish within this system that we're in so our codes of conduct have to include things like don't kill don't steal don't cheat with a man's wife but you don't need god to tell you this You don't need a God in a burning bush to tell you this. The only reason why, and this is my opinion now, the only reason why God was using those old stories was because you needed to scare the people to listen. And to listen in particular to the figure of Moses. That's how Moses became the leader. He was the only one who could have talked to God and received those laws. But if Moses was a thinking man, a smart man, he could have written those laws himself. And like we know now, Moses really got those laws from from Kemet. Right? So this is a good starting place of laws that your family, your friends, and other relatives should be using. Now we have to update some of the laws some of our codes of conduct, we have to update it for this day and age that we live in. But this is a good starting place. If you start to think like this, I don't care how many vans they park by, you know, in the hood filled with Nike sneakers or how many guns they drop off in boxes on street corners. I don't care how much of that they do. They could never knock you off your square. They can never make you be the savage that they're trying to to, to design, that they're trying to create. So when we talk about codes of conduct, start here. Start here. If I had to add anything to this, I I I would add something about reading. I would add something about building and being a producer, right? But this is where you need to start. Okay? Thank you for listening to this episode of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Until next time, I hope you guys have a lot of peace and a lot of blessings. Later. Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. 
This has been a KWAZ Radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Bitter Medicine Show, Twitter, Bitter Meds, Tumblr, Bitter Meds, Instagram, Bitter Medicine.